So let's see how all of this works in code. Here we start by making alligator our current namespace, and then we use the standard library refer to take all of the interned mappings of closure.core and referring them into the current namespace alligator. What this means in the next line is that the symbol plus sign resolves in the current namespace alligator to a referred mapping. And that referred mapping is the very same mapping found in the namespace closure.core, so the var is the same, it's the same function. So effectively we are using the function from the namespace closure.core. A very common complaint about Lisp is the heavy preponderance of parentheses. Closure actually improves upon this to some degree because in other dialects of Lisp you don't have literals for vectors and hash maps, but in Clojure you do and they can serve in place of what normally would be parentheses in other dialects of Lisp. But either way, I really don't think Lisp is hard to read because of the parentheses. If Lisp is hard to read and hard to figure out how to write stylistically, it's because of the indentation style, which is pretty screwy in my opinion. It's not so bad when you get used to it, but it can be a bit tricky to figure out at first. Let's take an easy case and say we have this list that has a whole bunch of arguments and we want to spread it onto multiple lines. Well, when we do this, we simply indent in underneath the opening parenthesis, and the standard list style is to indent just by two spaces. Which arguments we choose to group together on individual lines is up to us, that's a matter of style. Sometimes the arguments which we're spreading onto succeeding lines are themselves lists, and generally, particularly longer lists, you're going to want to put on their own line, but you don't have to. And these lists, which are arguments, uh, they themselves you might want to split up because they might be overly long. And when you do, it's basically just the same rules. You indent in by two spaces. Sometimes you have an interior list, a list which doesn't start at the start of the line, which you want to actually spread onto multiple lines. And when you do this, again, you're indenting in by two spaces, but you do so two spaces starting from the start of that list. And when you do this, if there's any arguments after that interior list, then they should continue indented in two spaces, but two spaces respective to the list which contains them, not the interior list. Sometimes you'll see the rule of indenting by two spaces broken, particularly when it allows us to line up, say, parentheses. So here, for instance, the indented line is lined up such that the parentheses matches the parentheses above it. Sometimes with interior lists, the rule of two is bent in a way such that the continuing lines actually line up with the start of the list. However, this is most commonly done not when continuing an interior list, but an interior vector. So unfortunately, the rules of indentation can't really be summarized other than indent by two spaces, except when you don't. So let's continue introducing the special forms. The special form do simply takes a list of expressions. This list of expressions is often called the body of the do. The expressions of a do form are simply executed in order, and the do itself returns the value returned by the last expression. So here first beetle is called, then print, and then shark, and whatever shark returns, that's what the do returns. The let special form is like do, except it adds this ability where you can bind values to names, so that for the sake of this let, you can establish a name, say, foo, which has some certain value. These name value pairs you can see are written inside a, a vector, and the reason it's a vector is just because of the square brackets are easily distinguishable, so that you can tell what part are meant to be the name value pairs, and what part are just meant to be the expressions. So here, for instance, we have a def for the name frog, and the value being assigned to the frog is the value returned by this let. The let only has one single expression, a call to lion with the argument cow, but as you can see in the vector, we are binding the value 6 to the name cow. So for inside this let, the symbol cow resolves to the value 6. It doesn't resolve to a namespace. It's a local variable effectively. So frog here is going to be assigned whatever is returned from calling lion with the argument 6. In this next example, the let body has two expressions. The first is a call to ostrich with the argument tiger, and the second a call to urchin with the argument manatee. And as you can see, inside the vector, we are establishing two names. We're establishing the name tiger with the value of whatever was returned from bat called with an argument of three, and another name manatee with the value which is just the string yo. So for the duration of the body of the let, the symbol tiger is going to resolve to this value returned by bat3, 
and Manatee is going to resolve to the string yo. And the let itself returns the value returned by its last expression, which in this case is the call to urchin with the argument of Manatee. The special form fn defines and returns a function. Like a let or a do, it has a list of expressions which form the body, and then it has in vector notation, it has a list of parameters, which are just symbols. And optionally, it also starts with a symbol for a name. And this symbol name is used to, inside the function, refer to the function itself. So say you can have a function return itself or call itself and so forth. So here we have this def, which is binding this function to the name duck in the current namespace. And this function has a single parameter called a. The body of the function consists of just one expression, adding the value of a to 4. And because a function returns like a let or a do, the last expression that is executed in it, this function will return the value returned by a plus 4. So in the next line, when we call duck with the argument 7, that will return the value 11. In the next example, we are creating another function which we're assigning to the name sloth in the current namespace. And this function takes no parameters and it gives itself the name b. And then it has two expressions in the body. First, it's going to print hello. And then the next expression is simply the name b. So the function returns itself. So in the next line, when we call sloth, that prints hello, and that call itself evaluates into the function itself, the function object. So you can think of a let and an fn as both establishing a scope. In a let, you have this scope in which you define names, and for the duration of that scope, those names exist. The same with the function, except in the function, the names are the parameters. The term lexical scope refers to a scheme in languages whereby names refer to the most immediate thing in which they are contained, the most immediate scope. So here, for example, we have this fn form inside let. And as you can see, the fn has a parameter, which it calls manatee, and the let also has a name, which it calls manatee. So the question is, what does manatee refer to in which context? Because Lisp has lexical scoping, the answer is simple. Inside the fn form, manatee refers to the parameter of that function, and whereas outside in the let, manatee refers to the name bound in the let. So when we call urchin, what's getting called, uh, the argument is the string yo, whereas when we add manatee to 4 in the function body, what you're doing is you're adding the value of the parameter to 4.